I'm missing something? I don't hear anything yet. Okay. All right. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Miller. I'm the, I'm the president of the Dallas Division of Dallas Builders <laughs> Association this year. We'd like to welcome everybody to our February uh, Dallas Division uh, luncheon and uh, to our realtor panel. Uh, I'd like to introduce Phil Crone, the executive director of the Dallas Builders Association, to give us an update on permitting issues. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I uh, hate to be Zoom in the car guy, but the schedule demands it. And <laughs> I really wanted to let everybody know on an important issue that we've been doing everything in our power to try to transcend. And that's the crippling delays that we've seen with the permitting office and most significantly with single family residential permits in the city. Uh, we've finally made a breakthrough here in the last week in terms of getting the city the third party help that it needs and finally has admitted that it needs. And there are third, three third parties that have gotten started uh, permitting and looking at the about 400 homes that are in plan review right now. Uh, they took the first 100 or so starting yesterday. They're going to turn those through pretty quickly. And then our advocacy is going to focus on clearing the rest of those 400 that are in the backlog, not on the city's pace, but on our pace, meaning that it needs to get done by the end of the month and not the end of next month. Uh, so I need to hear from those of you, especially who are builders, the kind of input that you're getting. Are you seeing things move any faster as the customer service responsiveness improved? Are there any other issues that are popping up in terms of uh, water department accounts or floodplain reviews? Just all these whack-a-mole type of things that we've been having to deal with uh, throughout this pandemic and even before that with this city. Uh, but just know that I'm doing, the association, the Dallas division leadership are doing absolutely everything in their power to get this thing moving. You've seen a lot of us in the media and I know that there's more that we need to do and there are more challenges ahead of us, but it's a really important thing for our members, for our city, for the residents, for the workers that rely on us. And we're not gonna stop until we get those timelines back to a reasonable uh, timeline. So uh, any questions that you have, because I don't want to take too much time for the great panel that we have, you can email me at phil.crone at dallasbuilders.com, P-H-I-L dot C-R-O-N-E at dallasbuilders.com. And I appreciate your support and we're going to get this done. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. And, you know, as a builder, I really appreciate uh your continued effort on the permit front and the continued effort of the staff. We, we, uh, looks like we're starting to make some progress there. Well, we'd like to thank our 2021 year long partners, facets, appliance, kitchens and bath, prosperity bank, Foxworth Galbraith lumber company and Riddell plumbing. And now I'd like to introduce, uh, year long partner, Steve Puckett with prosperity bank to say a few words. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, the DBA and the Dallas Division for allowing us to continue as a year-long sponsor of this meeting. Uh, I'm the treasurer of, of the uh, division here, and I, along with our other sponsors, uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, we, we couldn't do this meeting without uh, their, their, their sponsorship. We're trying to get back to in-person meetings soon, but uh, we know this isn't quite as fun to be virtual, but uh, that, that's the way it is these days. We're trying to play it safe. Uh, and I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, we got a great panel here. Uh, I don't know if you could ask for a better power panel of our realtors to talk about this subject. And I want to point out too, they're all members of the association. Joe Atkins being our most newest minted member of the association. So we appreciate him for joining up with us. Uh, I think there's some other bankers here on the call with us. You know, the bankers are all busy. We're all uh, busy with business. Uh, rates are good. Uh, so we, we appreciate everybody's support. Um, um, so uh, thanks again for everybody being here. Uh, one of the traditions we do at the in-person meetings, we have drawings, we give away uh, gift cards. So I'll quickly do that here. Uh, Phil, don't get worried. I will have somebody weld the uh, Associates Trophy back. Prosperity Bank is the Associate of the Year. I'm using it for my earn for uh, a giveaway. So I'm going to pull everybody who's on the call today has been entered into the drawing. So I'm going to pull that out of the, out of the hat here. And if any builders know good welder to put this trophy back together, let me know. We'll get that taken care of. So here's all the names. So the winner of our gift card is uh, James Moore. Oops, sorry. James Moore with Keen Homes. So thanks again for allowing us to uh, 
be a sponsor and uh, I apologize for the sloppy presentation here. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our year-long partner, Phil Smith, with Facets of Dallas to say a few words. Hey, everybody. Uh, Phil Smith with Facets of Dallas, uh, the showroom formerly known as the Bath and Kitchen Showplace. Uh, we did something crazy last year and opened a new space, uh, 25,000 square feet of appliances, cabinets, plumbing, hardware, uh, trying, to, try, trying to create a one-stop shop. So if we can help in any of those categories, feel free to reach out. Look forward to our uh, realtor panel and I'll stop talking. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. All right. We're about to start our, uh, our realtor panel, but first, just a reminder, we'll be taking questions for this program. Please put any questions you have in the Q&A section. You can find that feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the program. Also, this webinar will be recorded and made available uh, on Dallas VA's YouTube channel and Facebook. All right. I'd like to introduce our uh, moderator and panel for this realtor panel today. Our moderator is going to be Britt Fair of Fair Texas Title. And the panel is Joe Atkins of Joe Atkins Realty, Cliff Kessler of Allie Beth Allman and Associates, Sharon Reed, uh, Sharon Red of Dallas uh, of uh, Dave Perry Miller Real Estate, and I believe also Kyle Ball of Compass Real Estate will be joining us. All right, um, Britt, go ahead and take it away. Well, great, Richard, I appreciate it. And uh, just uh, from a, I'm just looking to see if Kyle has made it on. So it does not look like it yet. So uh, we have a great panel today. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Cliff and Sharon and Joe can do a great job. And if, if uh, Kyle's able to join us, uh, then he will. Uh, but the, the goal today, as it is every year with this uh, event, is to give the builder audience the perspective of the, uh, the agents that are out uh, seeing properties, buying properties, selling properties. And we have a great, great group to, to do that today. So I'm going to start out sort of with a, you know, it's been a weird year. Uh, that, that's the understatement of the, of the day, I guess. But uh, I, I guess the, the first question really is, what has, what has changed for you in the last year? Uh, what's, what are you doing differently 11 months or, or whatever it's been now since the, the pandemic hit uh, from what you were doing before? So, uh, Cliff, you want to you start and hit, hit us with that one, what you're, what you're doing differently? Yeah. Absolutely, Brett. And so for me, you know, I do business here in Dallas and also in California. And I've seen, you know, a huge jump in my business from people from California moving here uh, for a lot of reasons and people from New York moving here. And so because of that, I've had to do a lot more um, video tours, uh, you know, 3D tours, um, actual drone camera videos for even some of my smaller listings that's new construction. And I've sold a, a handful of properties without even people coming here to see them with conversations over the phone uh, or their son who's local and the dad buying it in California. So a lot of that's changed from you know, how we used to sell properties before. All right, just as a follow-up, and we're going to get to the other panelists, but buying houses without seeing them, okay? So yeah. That's, um, <laughs> Just give a little more <laughs> into that because that seems like so, pretty revolutionary. Yeah, so we're still doing tours, but I've done Facebook Live tours with these. Like I had, for instance, a uh, a dad from USC who was buying something from his kid here, had never been to the unit, new construction, walked him through on Facebook. They wrote an offer. The son came by and came for the inspection, but the dad who bought the property never actually came here because he was afraid to travel. So some of that's happening where you're getting people that are, you know, doing video tours. And I've, some of my associates in my office, the same thing. You get someone from overseas, they want to buy a property here. They know Dallas is a hot market, but they don't want to travel. They're buying stuff over the phone or through video tours. Wow. That's, that's amazing and scary and all, all of those things all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sharon, how about you? What's, uh, what's different in your, you know, compared to what you were doing 11 months ago? Um, I would say very much what was just said, uh, just over the weekend, I did three different buyers for listings of mine that we literally did FaceTime with their clients all the way through the house. Um, 
from California and from New York, and I did it last week from Denver. So um, a lot of different methods that we've never used before where people are coming on and wanting to see every inch of it, and they've already studied the houses, so then they go through and they want to see exactly where that space is. Um, they make their short list from there and then they come, they will come. A lot of them aren't wanting to travel. They want to make one trip and they want to see everything that they've seen through their agent. Um, I think I've done a lot more social media this last year. I've done a lot more advertising on there. I've done a lot more um, I'm getting ready to do some videos about business that are going to be on there. I've also added, I think, um, more networking with agents. Um, more networking with my past clients, which I stay in touch with all the time, but just with inventory being where it is right now, um, just more more conversations of where people are and people's needs have changed. Great, thank you. Uh, Joe, what's what's different in your world? You're on mute, there you go. Okay. Oh man, where do I start? So, you know, be this being February uh, 2021, it's crazy if you, you know, see old pictures, you know, whether it's your memories in Facebook or whatnot that pop up from February of 2020, because we were still, you know, I had a deal pop up with, uh, you know, my kid and my family at a friend's Super Bowl party last year. Obviously, that's going to look different this year. And, uh, you know, you, you talk to clients that you were working with around this time going into the pandemic, and then you get kind of a flashback of like, oh my God, yeah, you know, uh, I actually was doing a deal with Sharon, uh, <laughs> crazy, crazy deal, and it was a, uh, you know, uh, you know, a builder to builder deal, you know, a land deal, and uh, we were supposed to close that deal, I believe, March 31st. And we all know what happened uh, come about March 13th. So, you know, really, I think for me, it's been the evolution of end of March, early April, when everybody's like, are we ever going to sell a house again to, uh, you know, late April, early May, where we're like, well, guess what? You know, in our office, we were all debating, you know, that's when we were sheltering in place. And I was like, look, I'm calling other agents that didn't pull their listings off the market and seeing what their activity is. And that's when we made the decision during shelter in place, like two thirds of inventory came off. We went on, we, we went to plan with the stuff and everything we had sold in a week or less. So, you know, you go from that shift to the end of third and fourth quarter of rock bottom interest rates. And now, you know, everybody's working from home, and needing more space to then now here we are in you know February 2021 where us as realtors don't have houses to sell. So you know in a year we've gone from what was I, I call BC before COVID to DC during COVID uh, where you know we went from scared that we'll never sell a house again because you know the pandemic the market's going to crash. So now we don't have any houses to sell anybody. So, man, it's been a whirlwind. And, uh, you know, you just kind of got to, you know, like everybody else before me said, you just got to regroup, you know, and deal with the current market conditions. This, this is sort of the follow up to that, that line of questioning. And I'll, I'll start with you, Joe. Uh, and that is, how do you see this playing out? You know, this, uh, this inventory shortage, I mean, rates are great. And right. I was going to say that way, but uh, you, you know, we got a home builder audience, right? And yeah, yeah. Home builder audiences love when there's so much demand, except right. they, except they don't, you know, you can't just snap your fingers and put product. Right. So right. How does this end up, end up in your world? I mean, well, you, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, you know, I started to see all this come to a head about, you know, mid December when our market typically slows down uh, seasonally. You know, I'm looking around and, you know, I live in the Lakewood area and I'm looking at, you know, let me see how many homes are on the market, one to two million. And when I pull it up and it's showing me five, I'm like, well, that's a problem. You know, that's problematic. And, uh, you know, uh, where we are now, you know, 
I've got builders, uh, you know, that I've worked with calling me almost weekly, like Joe, you coming across any lots, you know, because builders have the same problem we have. Like, you know, obviously builders don't make money unless they sell houses. Like, so they need inventory, like we need inventory. So we're kind of in this together. And, you know, honestly, we, we had our first office meeting in January and I told my agents, I'm a broker, I have a small brokerage, about 15 agents. I was like, I'm nervous. Like, this is honestly the most nervous I've been since the crash. I've been in real estate 14 years. I got in no seven right before the crash. And this is the most nervous I've been because I can tell you, me personally, I've got about 10 buyers that I can't either get under contract or find anything for. And if you have no inventory, we can't sell anything. So, I mean, it's, it's concerning for sure. Yeah. You know, usually the, the concerned realtor is, is usually the other side, you know, like correct, if, correct. Like, think back to 2008, you know, we were all worried, like, are there enough buyers? There's, you know, you right. Know, right. And, you got to convince buyers to buy houses. Right. And now it's a totally opposite concern that you're, you're airing which right. is too many buyers, not enough property. I so. mean, you know, to the average person I talk to, they think it's a great problem. I'm like, no, it's a terrible problem because you as the end user, anything you're buying is now, you know, I told a buyer of mine uh, I've been working with for a few months yesterday, I said, look, and I'm not telling you this as like a push you off, you know, to get you to like be more proactive, but each month that you wait to buy a house, at least in uh, Dallas proper, from the research I'm doing, the market's going up about one and a half to 2% a month. So I said, between now and this summer, given where inventory is, you're probably going to see a 10% 10, 10 increase on the same house you're looking at today. Interesting. That's real money. Yeah. Cliff, how about you? What it, how do you see this uh, inventory shortage problem playing out? There's a couple of parts to it. And I think one of it is, is spurred by something that took effect last year, which was really in place before, but it is this clear cooperation policy where everything is, is pretty much now a secret. Uh, before, if you had a hip pocket or a coming soon, you could somewhat, there was a gray area of how you could kind of push that out to your fellow realtors that you work with and who do a lot of business with. And now they're finding people if you push out any marketing on a property that's coming up or coming soon. And a lot of this I was doing with my new construction properties where I said, hey, we're, we're almost complete. You know, we're going to push this property and see if we can market it to the public. Well, a lot of these are selling in-house before it even goes to market now um, because everyone's so afraid to pitch it out. And so someone who's got buyers looking for new construction, Lakewood, where I do a lot of business or M streets or wherever it's already sold, you know, in house and in, in, in our brokerages, because we can't really push it out to the public anymore. And so that's part of it. And then, you know, the other part of it too is, is just that, you know, the rates are so low that people are just jumping on things. And a lot of times before people would sit on it, they'd make you know, kind of a decision, they'd shop it around. But if they find something that's a pretty good deal, they're like, all right, let's pull the trigger. Let's write the offer today. I mean, I had someone I showed three properties to last week and there were my, I just met with them for the first time and they were like, we're gonna write an offer today. <laughs> and so, you know, it could be good and bad on both ends of the deal. But, you know, like Joe was saying, there's just, there's not a lot of inventory. And if something pops up, it's pretty much sold if it's, you know, East Dallas market, M Streets, Lakewood, you know, Lake Highlands um, instantly. And I hope that, you know, I, was, I had lunch to my builder uh, buddy yesterday, one of my builder buddies, and I said, we need to do some more spec builds in Lakewood. I think they were so afraid to do spec builds over there. And I'm like, I'll find you the lots. Let's go. Let's start tearing these things down and build new construction in that, you know, 4,000 to 4,500 square feet. People need that right now. And there's a, there's a market for it. Great. We'll talk, we'll talk more about uh, the, the actual products and people want, but Sharon, I want your thoughts yeah. on how do you, uh, how do you feel this whole shortage problem that we're describing here? How do you see it playing out? I would have to agree with what, what uh, Joe and Cliff said. I, I, I think it's a very unknown at this point. Um, the supply and demand issues are, <laughs> so many more buyers than there are houses to sell. There are competitive markets. Um, I, I do a lot in Preston Hall in the Park Cities. Uh, I do a lot of new builds and I've sold every new build I have before it was even framed because there's not a lot out there. Um, 
I would agree that not being able to share the information like we did before makes it really difficult and stuff is only being able to be shared within brokerages. And so you really don't know what's out there. Uh, I think the buyers want to know what's out there. Um, I, I don't see it changing. I see this being kind of the way it's going to be for a while. And I don't see that the influx of buyers coming here stopping. Um, I think lots are hard to find. I mean, I know we'll probably talk about that, but I, I think the spec business, there's a demand for it. And there, there's just not a lot of, there's not a lot of lots that are available that are reasonable to be able to go out there and do it. That one to $2 million price point is, I mean, anything that you could get new that's two million or less, there isn't anything. Um, and the upper end, I think, is also a market that we've never seen this much activity in four million and above. Um, and that's both, I think, um, on the ground and already, you know, pre-existing and also new builds. I mean, when you see how much is going in that market and that buyer's coming here, and that's local and out of town. I think there's a lot of local buyers that are, you know, trading up. Um, there's a lot of trade-ups everywhere. So I, I really think that this is what it's, this is it. I don't know how it's going to change, but what we've got right now is going to be with us for a while, I think. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm hearing from all three of you is, uh, you know, the, the key feature is that you have a house built being built. Like, you know, if, if we're, if we're, it's, we're, none of you has said, well, they don't want two story. They want one story. You know, it's, it, you said they're buying it when they're framing it. I mean, that's so number one, you know, we can, we're going to get into a lot of design detail questions, but it's, that's just, uh, you know, what I'm hearing here is that just getting more product being more aggressive on the home builders. And it's not that obviously it's not that easy, right? I mean, you still have to have lots and you still have to have labor and you still have to have building materials and all those things, but um, okay, so I'm going to turn the attention just a little bit toward some construction type questions, and that is, uh, and Sharon, I'll, I'll start with you on this one as well, but, you know, what, from a design standpoint, what have you picked up to, uh, from your clients, from your buyer clients that sounds like it's more attractive now? Uh, what are you seeing that you hadn't seen maybe uh, before that that's, uh, you know, architectural plan designs, uh, interior designs, you know, what's, what's hot now, aside from, you said framing? <laughs> um, I think the market has changed a little bit in what people want. I mean, I do a lot of new construction and I think um, there's more, what I would call more traditional touches kind of coming in and out. Um, definitely not as modern, uh, more transitional. I mean, it still needs to be very transitional. But because people have been home for so long, um, that trade up that I'm talking about is a lot of local people who have outgrown because they're all spending their time at home, right? Now they're all working from home. So the plans and the things that I think we've tweaked from an original plan before COVID to a plan that we're working on now is two office spaces, his and hers, away from each other, where the people can actually work from home, trying to build some sort of study nook where kids can work from home and have a place to, you know, not just either a built-in desk in the room or some little area where they can, they can work. I think um, backyard spaces are key. Um, I think we've seen a lot of people who want to get back into a house and with a yard and not in communal spaces if they've been in some sort of vertical living. So I think that, that's a lot of it. Um, seeing a little Mediterranean come back. I definitely have seen gray go away and lots of color, blues and greens and Naturals, a lot of natural woods, um, you know, highlighted with accent colors, um, blacks, golds, um, but definitely from a floor plan standpoint, I think it's having these spaces, extra living spaces, outdoor spaces, and workspaces. Um, I think those are, when people are designing or changing these houses from a floor plan we already had, we're adding something, but we added it before because I could see some of this coming with just office space, people working from home together. Great. Right. Uh, Cliff, how about you? What are you, uh, what are you seeing differently from a year ago and in, in, uh, what your buyers are desiring? Yeah. So one of the things that I thought was kind of an interesting feature was, you know, about a year ago, we were kind of doing away with the pantry space. Uh, you know, a lot of builders are saying you don't really need as big of a pantry. Most of these 
uh, new builds or open shelves. Now people want to see their bowls out. They want to see everything. And then when the pandemic hit, everybody had all this extra toilet paper product and, you know, five boxes of Rice Krispie treats. And they're going, where are we going to put these now? And so we're seeing the trend kind of go back to, I just walked a new build yesterday with a big pantry again. And so I think that's kind of reversing, uh, which is kind of interesting. Also building out for having enough room in the backyard, which I think Sharon was mentioning for a pool. Um, pretty much anything I have with a pool sells because the parents are going, we're at home. We need the kids to do something. We don't really want them running around with the neighbor kids, you know. So if we have a pool in the backyard, they can go back there and play and get their energy out. So there's a lot of that. If, if it's not built into it for new builds, it's at least it's built so they could accommodate a pool, right? Um, the other thing is, yes, we're seeing the two offices, the, the larger spaces. A lot of these builders um, that our work was working with were building somewhat of a smaller footprint um, because everybody's trying to save on taxes uh, over a year ago. And now it's kind of reversed and everyone's going, we're all at home with the family. We're, 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 pu we're pulling each other's hair out. We need a bigger space. So they're not really thinking about the taxes anymore. They're thinking we need more, more place for everybody to go. So I think the, the trend that had reversed from a smaller build over a year ago is getting a little bit larger now in the footprint. Great. Joe, how about you? What are you seeing differently uh, sort of a year later? Oh, and you're on mute right now. So there you go. Yeah. Um, you know, like Cliff and Sharon said, obviously, uh, the home office. I mean, you know, right now I'm actually doing this call from home because I have an appointment over here in East Dallas after. And, you know, my wife typically is the one that's in our office because I usually go to my office and, you know, we're both on calls right now. Um, so, you know, I've got lots of clients that now both, you know, husband and wife or, you know, spouses are working from home. So you definitely need that space, especially if your kids are home, you know, uh, the kids that are hybrid and things like that. Uh, the number one thing I think, you know, builders got to start doing that I know a lot of builders don't put it on the price point is pools. I mean, I drive down my street and right now I think there's eight pool signs in yards. Um, everybody wants a pool. It just, you know, I feel like three quarters of my clients I talk to, they're like, is the yard big enough for a pool or does it have a pool? I mean, that, right. I mean, to me, that's the big, uh, you know, pandemic buy that everybody wants is a pool. Um, so, you know, and to touch on what Cliff said, it's crazy because, you know, five years ago, the, you know, like Cliff was saying, everybody was trying to get that smaller house, you know, going from, you know, when they were building the big McMansions, 6,000 feet, you know, everybody was trying to stay in that 35 to 4,000 foot footprint. Now, because everybody's home, you know, they want to have bigger play areas and the extra offices and all that. So now you're seeing the footprints of most of these new homes um at least in east dallas you know preston hollow everything's starting at 4500 feet and going up from there so yeah okay so this is a follow-up question to that one uh and obviously the the audience today home builders you know the timelines are such that you know they've got to identify a tear down lot they've got to negotiate to buy a tear down they gotta right. uh you know so there's a there's a time lag here so let's just say that they're listening to, to the advice of the three of you, right? And, but but the product is not going to be on the ground for a year. Let's just right. I'm say a year. So, of the trends that you all just articulated, a year from now, hopefully we're mostly post COVID. Right. So, which of these trends sticks, and which of these trends is super trendy now? But you predict isn't going to be as big an issue a year from now. Maybe one of each, one that's gonna stick and one that's uh, one that's not gonna stick. And I'll start with you, Joe. Um, Man, tough question. I mean, I really think uh, definitely with, you know, the change in, you know, how people live, I think the pool, I mean, that's my number one thing. You know, I think people now, and I know I'm one of them, right? Like, you know, from, I remember looking at my credit card statement from February to March and then um, April to May. And my bill was like 35% less because we were home. We weren't eating out, you know, like, 
And so I think, you know, your average person looks at that spending and they're like, man, we were spending so much money on just going out and doing this, doing that. We have this beautiful home, beautiful backyard, you know, putting a pool in is an investment. And then I think they, you know, you start to see how much fun you have with your family, things like that. So I think the pool definitely is going to stick post COVID. You have uh, one that you think of that might, might just be a temporary COVID related, I won't call it a fad, but. Right, right. Um, I really don't. I mean, I think all, everything that can, like, I think the way people work is, is changed forever. You know, I think obviously you're going to have a sector of people that do go back to the office. But there's a lot of people that are just, you know, companies found that they're just as effective working from home and you're, the companies are saving money. So I think office, the, the, the need for the office space isn't going to change. Pantries, you know, I think, again, a lot of these things we've mentioned, I think people realize, like, when you look at the cost savings over time of spending more time at your house, I mean, hey, it's your largest investment. And I think, you know, that was the number one thing I realized was it seemed like the average, uh, you know, the average American probably spent one third of their life at home pre-pandemic, where now you have to imagine the average person spending 70% of their time at home. That's a huge variance, you know, and, you know, you're spending a lot of money, you know, buying these new bills, especially now, and why, why not enjoy it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Sharon, what about you? What do you think uh, of these trends that we've seen over this past year, a, a year plus from now, what do you think stays with us? And what do you think uh, might might just be a temporary trend? Um, maybe the only temporary might be having your kids at home more. I mean, at some point, I guess they will all go back to school, um, hopefully, but I don't see office space changing. I would agree with Joe. I think companies are learning and people are learning they can work from home and both, you know, um, partner, spouses, whatever. I mean, everybody can work from home, but they need their own separate space. So I don't see that changing. And I definitely don't see pools changing. I mean, all my specs, we we priced with a pool. And I think that has a big bearing on why they sold so quickly. But um, it's a big factor because it's that or they're moving to the lake. So, I mean, it's one of the two where lake living got so big that you can't find anything out there either um, versus being at home all the time and wanting that outdoor space. So I think the yard size, the lot size, the pool is they're willing to make the investment for that. I, I don't see that changing. Okay. Cliff, how about you? What do, what do you see being specifically something that you think could be temporary? Because I'm not hearing a whole lot of other temporaries. Cliff, do you hear me? Are you frozen? I see you moving. Okay. I think he may be frozen. So, or maybe I'm frozen. So, um, okay. So I'll, I'll come back to well, you. Well, I think maybe to be oh, the, there you are. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Can you hear me? You got me? To be the, the devil's advocate. You lost me? Go ahead. Okay is that, you know, I think the office space could be potentially built out as an additional bedroom, and then it could be versatile to be built as an office, because will that be an issue a year from now? We don't know. Maybe people will get sick of each other. Maybe they'll go back to an office space. Uh, so if I, was, if I had a crystal ball, I think I might build it so that it could be versatile, either a bedroom or an office. And I do agree with them. Uh, a pool, yes. I think even before the pandemic, a pool was a great feature to a new build that was selling, and it was a great feature. So those are my... The, the caveat against that. Okay. Um, again, I'm gonna build on this same topic because one of one of the answers that I kind of expected to the questions about changes or whatever uh, was going to be related to kitchens. Um, and Joe kind of alluded to it about uh, eating out and then all of a sudden not eating out. So um, Cliff, I'll start with you, and that is. What are you seeing as the trend from a year ago to today as far as kitchen trends? How, how important are high-end features versus, you know, are people using kitchens more or is that just a myth? Those kinds of things. You know, I think they are using kitchens more. And I actually just met with a client yesterday on a new build where I was repping the buyer side and they had complained about the, the, the type of appliances that were put into the kitchen. I think that they, you know, in the past, someone might have gotten away with a, 
a higher grade low end like a KitchenAid. And now people want to see Wolf. They want to see a Viking. They want to see, you know, the higher end appliances because they're spending more time there. You might have gotten away with an electric uh, cooktop in one of these more of these modern builds. And a lot of people are at home, so they want to build with gas. See, they're at, where's the gas, you know, range at? And so I think that is a big piece of it. And there's the other part of the, of the puzzle was, uh, you know, I think I talked about the pantry was uh, people want a bigger pantry space. They want a walk-in pantry. Um, and, and I do think there is some aspect of the open shelving for this, you know, contemporary California buyer, or Arizona buyer that we're getting in here. And they like that modern look to the kitchen. But I do think you need to have a lot of storage built into it now. Sharon, are you seeing anything different uh, specifically related to, to kitchens? Uh, that you you think could stick as a change or or might be just a temporary fad? I'm actually seeing all the same things. The higher end appliances, um, double ovens. A lot of people really they want their oven space. They are cooking at home more, um, I, and I think storage is huge. And they will walk in um, and they want they want the higher end materials in the kitchen. So port side, your cool counters, your cool, you mean eating spaces. And that is important too. I think eating spaces, I know a lot of the new designs are, some of them are doing away with dining room. Some of them are adding that breakfast room aspect. I feel like that dining room, I'd have clients moving back here from out of town who specifically want the dining room. We changed a plan that we had that because of that. I think people may not be from entertaining, but what they want those separate spaces to be able to eat in um, and just as much storage as possible. Okay, Joe, I'll go to you and I'll tweak the question just slightly. And that is, is there anything different that hasn't been mentioned that you think is a lasting feature? And, and I'll, I'll also ask, do you think this kitchen usage thing is a permanent uptick or are we going to go back to building up those restaurant bills like you were talking about earlier? Um, well, to answer the second part of the question, I think obviously once, um, we, we were kind of more in the herd immunity vaccinated state. I think restaurants are going to go nuts. Um, I think there's pent up demand, myself included, to go and dine and, you know, enjoy, you know, the eating out experience. Um, you know, but with that being said, I think people will still be conscious of like, hey, like we've put a lot of money into these, you know, characteristics of our house. Um, so there are things that people are still going to want to, you know, enjoy. So I think we're obviously going to see a huge boom, restaurants, entertainment, travel, you know, that first six months once we're, you know, the numbers, you know, subside and whatnot. Um, and then, uh, your first question was about just anything else that you're seeing kitchen wise that your people are demanding, you know, um, like Cliff and Sharon said, I mean, Look, you know, I've been saying this personally, you know, for the past few years, like if you're building a million dollar, you know, million dollar and up house, you know, buyers these days are savvy enough to know uh, the difference in uh, KitchenAid and Thermador, you know, and, you know, I mean, I think just the expectation of, hey, I'm spending X amount of money, you know, I expect this house to have, you know, a certain level of appliance. And, you know, I think that's something from what I see, whether it's with builders I work with or houses I show new construction, we're starting to see that come around a lot more now than two years ago, where you were still seeing the, you know, what I call the like BC model of stuff in some of these higher end houses. Okay. I'm going to switch gears slightly, uh, and Sharon, I'm actually, I'll, I'll start with you on this question, but uh, my question is, one of the things you I mean, in sort of your opening remarks, one of the, probably the most important thing out there in the market is availability of a house, right? I mean, that sounded like just, that is the thing, like, is there a house even available to purchase? But ultimately, buyers are choosing sometimes between existing op. Uh, existing homes or new construction. So uh, I guess my question is, what are the, what are you seeing, Sharon, as the, the, the factors that might make someone pick one versus the other, aside from the fact that there is a house available if, of that category? Uh, 
I think some of it's timing. I mean, if you're looking at new construction, you've got somebody who's moving here and the house isn't finished, that, that, that may be their first choice, but it may not be their end result because they may just not be able to wait. Um, I think there is a buyer who still wants, doesn't always have to have something new, but I do think um, because they like the area or it fits the, the criteria that they're looking for, but they don't want to do any work. So if you've got that house that's pre-existing, I mean, they really just want to bring their toothbrush and like move in. Um, they really don't want to do a lot. And we're finding more houses that need that. So then there becomes a pricing, pricing issue, right? I'll buy the house, but my budget's X and I've got to do X, Y, and Z to it before I'm finished. So the more that the homeowner, I think, does up front in terms of updating, and there's some beautiful pre-existing houses out there that have had amazing updates, and they are selling. I saw one that I know about when under contract came on the market Monday, went under contract Tuesday. I know the house previously, and it was a very traditional house on the inside, and it's darker finishes, and now it's stunning. Um, but they want to see, they want to have it done for them. So they're willing to spend a little more on that pre-existing house. I think, you know, ultimately not everybody wants new construction, but a lot of the people that are moving here have very specific criteria about what they do want. And some of that pre-existing doesn't match that and they don't want to put the money in to do it. So their next choice is something new. Okay, Joe, I'll go to you next. And that is same question. And that is when you have buyers you're working with, uh, obviously number one is, is there a house available? But if you're picking them between two houses, one being new construction and one being uh, existing homes, what, what's the deciding factor for your clients? Well, since we're talking about right now, honestly, I mean, you really don't have those options. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I've, uh, I know Cliff was talking about earlier, we're talking about virtually showing clients. You know, I've got an investor from LA and uh, it was referred to me by an agent I know in Austin and he literally was like, look, we're looking to buy anywhere from 350 to 500 in the Plano area uh, strictly for uh, investment purposes, right? Like just, just straight rental. And he's telling me they just bought one in Austin and they've been looking in Austin in six for six months. And, you know, obviously he was, they were looking at pre-owned because that's what made sense. And then they realized, you know, the pre-owned prices and the stuff was going so fast when it hit, it made more sense for them to just buy a new construction house um, because there was actually some inventory available. So really, I think that's just what it comes down to in the current market. I mean, you it's know, whatever's available. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's funny because I just, I've never personally thought about selling an investor a brand new house as a rental property because usually the numbers just don't work. Um, but you know, here we are where there's no inventory. And if that's all you got to choose from, they got to spend, they got to put the money to work. I mean, it kind of is what it is. So yeah. I think it's a little different, you know, scenario, not being a retail buyer, but you we're running into the same problems with them as well. So, okay. Cliff, how about you? I know you deal, especially with a lot of, uh, a lot of out of town buyers you were talking about earlier. So is there any difference, uh, for your client yeah. base as far as that topic? And I think sometimes it's a learning curve for these buyers. Uh, for instance, I had a buyer uh, last month that we bought a house that they thought they could fix up. Went under contract, had a home renovator come over and try to give it the feel of a new construction house. And the budget that they received from that was actually going to push them above a new construction house that we had seen that was a little bit more in price point. So we pulled out during the option period and they went and bought the new construction house. So I think, you know, a lot of these people – either they, they figure it out within the first week or so, or they decide, hey, I can persuade them this is a good decision. Let's buy the new construction house rather than buying something that's a, a fixer upper where you've got, you know, aluminum wiring possibly in the walls or, you know, foundation issues. At least you know with the new construction that you've got that warranty most of the time, that one, two, 10 warranty. And, uh, and there's, you know that you're moving into a good product. There's going to be issues either way if it's new construction or old, but I just feel like there's a safety net for a lot of these buyers uh, and especially if they're moving from California, there's zero problems with foundation in California. We never had that issue here. It's a major problem, especially if you're in certain areas where the soils are worse, you know, and so I think a lot of these people want the security blanket of having that new construction warranty. Um, and it's something that I pitched to them. Okay. So all three of you have talked about, um, 
you know, needing more house than we needed before and some of the, you know, more space and all that. So for a home builder who is looking currently, and let's talk about, you know, these in-town home builder, in-town markets, you know, we talked about East Dallas or Park Cities or, or North Dallas or, you know, whatever. Um, what What is the, if the sweet spot square footage wise, if you were trying to plan something today to, you know, to have built in 20 and uh, completed it later in 2021, what square footage uh, is the right target now? Because it seems like we were in a trend before of shrinking houses. Uh, Cliff, I'll start with you. I would say somewhere between 4,200 and 4,700, somewhere in that range. And, you know, I think you could do a four bedroom in an office or a five bedroom. That's what I would, would say. Okay. Joe, how about you? Um, honestly, I think it really depends on the neighborhood because at the end of the day, dirt's gotten to a point of just being so expensive. I mean, the builders have to build a certain amount of size house to be able to like make the numbers work really. So, you know, your numbers are going to look a lot different if you're building in, uh, um, East Dallas versus Preston Hollow because lot sizes, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it really just comes down to the neighborhood. You know, I think in Lakewood, I'm really, I, I don't think I've seen a new construction house under 4,500 square feet in the last 12 months. Um, Preston Hollow, I'm thinking it's over 5,000 square feet. You know, Sharon sells a lot over there. She could speak more to that. Uh, so I think it really just depends on the neighborhood, you know, you still, you can still see, uh, closer to 4,000 square feet in Lake Highlands, um, the M streets, uh, but again, the cost of the lots are cheaper. So. Okay. Sharon, how about in the neighborhoods where you're selling, uh, what, what's the sweet spot you think if they're putting something on the ground square footage wise, what should they plan for? I think in Preston Hollow, it really is about 5,500 to probably 6,500. Um, I think when you start getting, uh, nobody really wants so much over that 7,000 mark so much anymore. There are plenty of really high-end homes being built right now that are much larger. And there are a lot of buyers out there right now for that product. But I think the most, the most that you see in that million and a half to $3 million is probably 5,500 to 6,500 um, with all the with all of those pieces, five bedrooms really does work the best. I think um, if you're a midway hollow, I think 42 to 45 is great. Those lots are not as big. So, and to Joe's point, I mean, the cost on those is different. And you, you know, each one of them to make the numbers work, they, you've got to be a little bit bigger, but that's a good price, a good square footage in midway hollow. Um, that, that's pretty much where I see it. I think it's about 5,500 to 6,500 in all most of Preston Hollow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question is sort of about uh, geography as far as opportunity. Um, are there any submarkets or even pockets of submarkets that you're seeing more teardown activity or more teardown opportunity in these in-town markets? I mean, obviously we can talk about volume building and in, uh, in you know prosper or something, but like in, in these sort of inside the loop type, uh, markets where where is their opportunity or where are you seeing i mean i saw the whole uh, bird streets area where with all the homes that got torn down over there and you know all of a sudden it went to a big a big number of uh, opportunities of teardowns but uh, joe i'll start with you where are you seeing opportunities in any of your markets as far as or or new activity uh well it's funny you mentioned that uh, first thing i was going to say is the area they now refer to as inwood park which is, uh, you know, the back end of the Bird Streets over by Love Field. Um, you know, I've sold a few new homes over there, and that still seems to be a, uh, you know, growing pocket. You know, it's crazy. I sold a house to a young lady there two years ago in the, you know, 35, 3,600 square foot range. And I want to say, you know, the time had been sitting on the market for a little while, and we got it for like 650. It appraised for 780. And I mean, you know, now I see houses down the street from her selling in the nights. So, you know, that was two years ago. Um, you know, another little uh, hot growing pocket is, uh, you know, 
Old Lake Highlands, uh, you know, Hexter Elementary, um, strictly because of the price point of the dirt, you know. Um, you know, I made an offer for a builder client on a lot over there a couple weeks ago. And I mean, I know what we offered was quite a bit over list price and we didn't get it. And the agent told me that we weren't even close. So, you know, I was kind of like, wow. I mean, okay. You know, like <laughs> thought we had a really good offer, but apparently not, but that's another hot area that's growing. Um, you're seeing a lot of new construction, you're seeing a lot of new construction and the, um, uh, what do they call it? Mockingbird, the area just, uh, I guess that would be north of Mockingbird, but it feeds into Mockingbird Elementary. Um, you know, uh, there's, you know, a lot of activity over there, Camden, those streets in there. Uh, and again, I think it really just comes down to the price of the dirt, you know, Lakewood, you know, lots now are all north of 500, M Street's you know, everything's pretty much 425 and up, uh, you know, Lake Highlands, good luck finding a lot, you know, Preston Hollow, you know, you're spending a million bucks and up. So I just, I think it really just, you know, it's come to a point of where, you know, and obviously different builders build in different price points. So it really it just comes down to like, what, what price point suits you, you know, Midway Hollow, that area, you know, I, I laughed when I heard a house was selling for a million dollars there three years ago, and now everything's over a million. Yeah. I mean, you know, markets change. Absolutely. Change so, fast. Sharon, I'll, I'll go to you next on this same question. Are, are, are there areas that you are seeing teardown activity? I mean, we'll, I'll ask specifically uh, Preston Hollow and Park City's areas, little subsectors of that where you're seeing opportunity, you know, tornado path uh, stuff, or, or is that already now too far in the past uh well no uh, i <laughs> my house was in the tornado path so i i'm definitely familiar with that um i think um my first one was going to be inwood park i think that's that became the the new midway hollow when midway hollow was being developed um to joe's point i mean i remember selling my first house in there and i think the lot price was two hundred thousand dollars so now you can barely find anything for 400 um in there in terms of lot it's hard to find in the threes um, I'm seeing a lot in Briarwood that seems to be coming back, a lot of new construction. I have a buyer moving here um, and there's a number of builders over there and there's a lot of good product. The lots are not that big over there, but the houses look really good. And that's an area that I don't think has had as much recently. And I, I think there's a lot happening in there. I think you still have your fair amount in, in Midway Hollow, but not nearly like what we had before. And in Preston Hollow, I think it's hit or miss. I mean, um, it just depends on how much you wanna spend on that dirt. I do a lot in Melshire and that's been a real popular area because the lots are bigger and we could do something for $2 million in there. Um, and I had one house I probably could have sold 10 times. I got it under contract really quickly, but everybody wanted to be in there. And I think that's becoming, even that's a little further north of Forest, it's just a good pocket and people like it because the lots are a little larger. Um, and then, you know, proper Preston Hollow proper, I think it varies. I mean, you can still find something maybe in the sevens, but it, it's gonna be a lot smaller. And to Joe's point, it just depends on what you're looking for. You can go up to a million and a half over there and for not a huge lot, but obviously a little larger. Okay. Uh, Cliff, how about you? I, I know you sell all over the place, but where do you see any specific areas of opportunity or uh, high activity? Yeah, so, so one of the places that wasn't mentioned that I've seen a lot of recent activity, in fact, one of my builders just bought 16 lots over there, was uh, kind of the area that's in Woodrow Wilson High School, which is, you know, a lot of the transplants that were in Lakewood that were buying these $2 million homes. Now their kids are going to Woodrow and to Long, the middle school. And so there's an area just south of Hollywood Heights, uh, you know, Glasgow, Chrysler, all those, those lots. They can trade from anywhere from a, a buck fifty up to two hundred, and there's money to make on the back end, especially if you have an architect using the same formula. You know, I know uh, one of my friends, Brandon Travelstead, works with a, a builder, and they had a bunch of new builds where they took down about eight lots and built up the same formula, and those sold in about two seconds. And now that whole area is really turned over. I just sold a, a new construction, brought a buyer to one over on Glasgow, and they love the area. And I know it's in a little bit of an upswing, but there seems to be a lot more going on, a lot more teardowns over there now just because you can buy them for a good price. 
Um, the other area is close to where they were talking about. It's in the medical district. So uh, I think, you know, uh, south of Maple um, over there, uh, there's a bunch of streets that are close to the hospitals. You have a lot of nurses, a lot of people moving here to get nursing jobs. Um, and so that's a really sought after area. And you can buy the dirt over there for about a buck fifty to two twenty, something like that. And then build either there's a lot of duplex lots for new construction and or you know smaller single families on the dirt there um, and there's a lot of money being made over there. Um, so those are the, the two areas that we've really been focusing on where we can buy for cheap and then sell at the higher price. Super, thank you. Okay, so we're kind of running low on time. So really, what I want to do is ask one final sort of question. Uh, and Cliff, I'll start with you. But that is, what. <laughs> What you know, sort of as a parting shot to home builders or parting advice? What what would your biggest advice be for 2021 to home builders? What if you had to boil it down into a you know 10 or 15 second piece of advice? What what is the biggest thing you would like to to make sure they understand? I would say build it now. Build it. If you build it, they will come. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We need we need more inventory. We need builders to build, and uh, we have the buyers. We all have a lot of buyers looking right now, especially in these really hot markets. You know, Lakewood, uh, M Street, Highland Park, Preston Hollow. They're ready to make moves, and so I say, take those chances. Get out there, buy the lots, and and build some spec homes for us. Okay, I'm writing these down. If you build it, they will come. That's Cliff. Yeah. Uh, Joe, Joe, what's your uh, parting piece of advice? If you could boil it down into a really cool soundbite, like if you if you build it, they will come. Uh, you know, Cliff's right. I mean, we, you know, I've never been in a situation like uh, we're in in 2021 where we've got more buyers than, you know, we can almost deal with, but we can deal with them because we don't have anything to show them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a weird situation. I mean, Again, you know, I think uh, from our point of view, we're having to make our buyers um, go down on their wants and needs. Um, and, you know, they're not going to possibly get everything they want because, you know what, there might be one option and you need to move. You got to make it work, you know. Um, and I think another thing is uh, really just, you know, for builders, I think, you know, um, yeah, like you guys need to just reach out to us. Uh, when I say us, the realtor community, because we're here to help you. Like we help each other. Like, you know, um, we need you guys just as much as y'all need us. I mean, you know, we can help you find the product, being the lots. And then um, obviously we, we want to bring you the buyer. So, um, you know, I'm now because I had to shift, like I'm talking to people in my neighborhood daily, trying to find lots, you know, we're, we're, we're boots on the ground. I mean, you know, I told all my agents, we got to go back to like, you know, basic real estate, you know, door knocking what we used to do when you first got in this business, because that's the only way we're going to find inventory. Yeah. So. Okay. Sharon, you, you get the last word. What, uh, what's your parting advice for 2021 for the home builder crowd on the call? I had an agent say something to me yesterday and I thought it was very true. She's like, finding houses is like when we were looking for Clorox wipes and hand sanitizer. Okay. It is, they're non-existent. Um, and so while well, I'd like to take credit for that, I thought it was really a very, very fair statement. I, I think what I would say is the same thing Joe said, and I don't think I, I've been doing new construction business since 2006 and I've seen the evolution of how lot prices work and it's always been buying a little less, you know, to be able to put up the product. But I think nowadays you got to buy them for what they're at and not worry so much about that end price because the buyers will pay it if it's there. And I don't think we all know material costs have gone up as well. So I think when you explain that to a buyer that it's just not you're that's not the way it used to be, but here's a good product and it's X and here's why, that here here's why it is, they're not fighting on it. They're not, they're not challenging on the prices of the new spec houses. They're buying them pretty much close to list. And they're making changes, which is helping the builders along the way, right? So there's change orders that go with that. So I think if it's out there, and to Joe's point, you know, we're all happy to help. All realtors are happy to help try and find that product. We do have the networks to do it um, because I believe the more you can get out there and price it where you need to, to Cliff's point, they will come and they will buy them. 
Awesome. Well, uh, Sharon Red, Dave Perry Miller, Joe Atkins, Joe Atkins Realty, and Cliff Kessler with Allie Beth Elman. Y'all have done a great job today. Thank y'all for sharing that wisdom. And I guess I will turn it back over to Richard. All right. Thank y'all so much. This was, uh, this was great. Uh, it looks like uh, may have a couple of quick questions. Um, I'll answer one of them. Are the builders seeing significant delays at the city level regarding permit plan submission and permit applications? Yeah, uh, yes, we are. And uh, we have been basically since uh, in the city of Dallas since COVID started. Uh, as Phil uh, Crone mentioned um, recently, uh, we are starting to see some serious movement on that with the with bringing in third party, uh, the city has brought in third parties to clear that backlog. So hopefully that will uh, quickly improve. Um, and it looks like, I think Joe, you already answered this one. What zip code sells the most? Did you answer that? I, you kind of answered yeah. that. Like, yeah. As of right now, pretty much any zip code inside the loop. Yeah. It's <laughs> honestly, I can, I, you, I can tell you all, outside the loop, it's the same way too. It's the same. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, like I said, I was showing an investor client the uh, high threes, low fours in Plano last weekend. Talked to the listing agent on the one house, you know, resell, you know, 90s build. They got 26 offers in two days. Uh, there's a house down the street here from where I live. And from talking to uh, the agent, they got 150000 over list price on a $1.25 million house with six offers. So, uh, and basically what that tells me is anywhere you live, you can almost, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but you can almost name your price if it's within reason in this market. Wow. That's amazing. All right. And uh, Misty, did Josh have a quick question? Well, it looks like he's got his hand up. Let's see. If he's there. Josh, do you have a question? No, that was by mistake. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much again. Uh, Britt, Joe, Cliff, Sharon, thank you so much. This has been very informative and, um, and uh, join us for our next, uh, for our next uh, Dallas division luncheon. See everyone later. Thank you for the invite. Appreciate thank you. you having us. Thank you. Thank you.